Welcome everyone um, to another Lunch and Learn in our ongoing Financial Friday series. Sainis is excited to offer these sessions in cooperation with our corporate partner, Equitable Advisors. Equitable has been a longstanding presence in New York and a large portion of Equitable's New York client base is built upon the work they do within the public education system. Through Equitable, Sainis members can receive competitive insurance rates and a full array of retirement services including a complimentary financial profile for SANES members, which we urge you to take advantage of because it's a great benefit. Our equitable presenter today is Kelly DeMay, Senior Vice President, Northern Complex. Before we get started, please note that participants are muted during the session, but we will have some Q&A time following the presentation. If you have a question, just type it in the Q&A panel or the chat box. We're also recording the session and it'll be available at sanis.org within the next week or so. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Kelly. Thank you very much. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good start to December. With that, um, today I'm gonna go over social security. Social security is actually quite complicated. There's many different um, avenues and different nuances to how it works. That's why if you ever call the Social Security office, it's a lengthy hold and wait time because there's a lot of specific questions. But my objective today is to give a baseline understanding of the pros and cons and weighing things out. Uh, so to get started this, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to address the very first question that typically comes up in the dynamic of the Social Security discussion in the sense of, you know, one of the you know, primary things that comes up in the discussion is, is it going to be there when I retire? And the short answer is yes. To give you perspective on this, Social Security, in the event, if it was a program, government program that didn't exist, 70% of people currently collecting Social Security benefits on the program, if they were not collecting those Social Security benefits, excuse me, if they weren't collecting those social security benefits, they would be on a different uh, government program, effectively uh, welfare. So the reality is that social security, even though some people are like, is it really secure? It's running out of money. Um, there are some challenges with the program. I'm not going to say that there's not, and I'll address what they are. But the other reality is, is that if it's not funded and this isn't supported, um, there's much bigger problems at bay. So will it be there? Short answer is yes. Will it always look the same? For many of the people on this call, yes. Um, for people in my position who are um, a good 30 years out from collecting their Social Security, it's probably going to look different then. So really it depends on the age and time frame that someone has. If you've been with me before, you know we are going to spend a good solid 10 seconds on this compliance slide. So that way, when this is posted on the CNES website for everyone to observe um, my compliance, which does check this and make sure that I have disclosed accordingly, then I'm not a Social Security advisor. I am just knowledgeable in the space and here to provide help, though it is not tax specific or legal in nature. So first and foremost, I'm going to address understanding the value of Social Security and how it works and why it's a big deal in short term and long term. Different types of benefits. Most of the time when we talk about Social Security, we're talking about in the front of retirement, but actually it serves a lot more purposes than just retirement is concerned. Factors which impact Social Security, how the taxes on Social Security works, and then collection strategies towards the end. So there are three main avenues of Social Security. One is based on retirement. 99% of the time when we're talking about Social Security, that's exactly what we're referencing is a retirement span or time frame when someone is using Social Security. That retirement benefit, meaning how much money somebody gets in retirement from Social Security, is based on a few factors. A, how long they've, an individual has worked. B, how much money they earned during those working years, and C, the age in which they collect. Those three pillars determine someone's monthly benefit. A second type of Social Security benefit is a spousal benefit. So if somebody is married, they have additional Social Security benefits that may apply to them. Doesn't always apply, but it may apply. If somebody is divorced, 
and was married for at least 10 years, they have some benefits that could apply. So just being married to somebody, and I'm going to actually talk about a personal example with this, kind of entitles someone already to Social Security benefits just by the nature of the beast. And then there's also survivor benefits. Survivor benefits are in the event that someone passes away. There are always Social Security benefits which pay out that range dramatically in the amount that pay out, but that's also a benefit that exists as part of the program. So let's talk about 101, how Social Security works. So um, on the left hand, I'm, I'm sorry, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a Social Security statement. This is updated. So the Social Security statement for 100 years was green and white. Um, and then it went to just being black, white, and gray because Social Security determined they no longer wanted to print them in color anymore. You know, that toner's expensive. We all live that life. And then now the new Social Security benefit is back to being printed in color and looks different than it did before. But I do think it does a pretty good job of explaining how things work and the benefits someone's going to receive right on page one. How you would get this is you would need to go to the website ssa.gov and create a login. You should, every single person on this call should absolutely go to that website and create a login. I actually logged my social security website personally probably four or five times a year. Um, it updates my earnings history all the time. There's really good information in there that's helpful and valuable. And someday when you go to apply for benefits, it is all done through that website portal. Now, I will give you a heads up. It's Fort Knox. So be really diligent about writing down your username and passwords and things of that nature, because it is difficult to get into. And that's a good thing. That's Social Security protecting all of our identities. If you've been through any challenges there, you value and appreciate the security. So let's take a deeper dive. So Social Security, I'd said, is based on three pillars. Pillar number one is number of years worked. So how Social Security works is they take your best 35 years worked to calculate your monthly Social Security benefit in retirement or pre-retirement if it's other benefits such as survivor benefits. When they do that um, and when Social Security evaluates that, they true up your earnings history through inflation. So let's say you're like, well, that stinks. In 1992, when I was a college kid, I made two grand a year you know, substitute teaching back then, that's not really fair that that weighs down that average. But that's not exactly true because what Social Security does is they take those years that everybody is going to have in their earnings history and they actually go back and they true that number up to what would that number be in today's dollars. So it is pretty fair how they evaluate it. Now, where I see this often with school employees in a negative space, let's say you retire at 55 with 30 years of service. When you look, go to collect your Social Security, if you don't have 35 years of earnings history, you've got zeros in that calculation. Let me give you an example. Let's say someone became a teacher at 22 years old and they worked till 55. They got 33 years of service with New York State and were eligible to retire. When they go to collect Social Security, Social Security is still going to evaluate their best 35 years. And there's going to be zeros or bogeys in there by the nature of the fact that someone retired when they did. That's going to negatively impact the Social Security formula. The benefit will be less. So yeah, the more money you make and the longer you work, the better the benefit gets. But I understand there's also a, a life element of enjoying life in there that's critical as well. And then on the right hand side, you can see that the amount you collect every year, um, if is the longer you wait to collect, increases. In this short, quick, don't get into the weeds on this. Social Security is a scenario where the longer you wait to collect, the larger amount of money you receive. Now, some of you, I already hear what you're saying. You're saying, Kelly, money today is better than money in the future. Um, that So I'll take money today, even though it's more in the future. You are not wrong. When somebody should collect Social Security is very, very uh, specific to that individual situation. But I will plant the seed more than once on this call that waiting to collect is a big deal. 
Um, so if you look at the right hand side, that bar graph that that exists, you're going to see in this example, if this person were to collect at 62, their Social Security benefit would be $2,477 a month in retirement. They were to wait till age 70 to collect. They would collect almost 4,500 a month, almost double what they would collect at 62. Think about that. Is there any time in your life that over eight years, 62 to 70, whatever eight years it was, you were able to get twice as much money? Not very frequently. I'm not saying it can't happen. It's just not very common. So my point is in that it is absolutely something to consider Collecting at 62 just because somebody turned 62 is sometimes the right approach, other times it's not. So let's talk about how much it's not and what that actually numerically works out to. So when somebody is what's considered their full retirement age or FRA depends on the year you're born. If somebody was born before 1937, that FRA would be 65. Between 1943 and 54, it'd be 66. After 1960, everybody is 67. And then between 1954 and 1960, for every year you add two months. So if somebody was born in 1955, their full retirement age would be 66 and two months. 1966 would be, or 1956 would be 66 and four months. So if you're like, why do I hear all these people with different, some people are collecting at 66 and a half and some at 67. That's correct. It's different based on every individual and the year in which they were born. However, anybody born after 1960, whether you were born in 1960 or 2022, your full retirement age at this time is 67. If you start to collect Social Security prior to your full retirement age and whatever that number is for you, you collect it at a reduced benefit. And I'm going to get into a deep dive as how much reduced at this time. Basically, if you collect early, which people are eligible to do as early as 62 with Social Security, um, Social Security does penalize you for collecting early. And then the longer you wait up till age 70, you get more benefits. They give you a raise for waiting. It would never make sense to collect your social security benefit after age 70. The benefit stops accruing at that point in time. So definitely if people are like, oh, I don't need to collect. I, I still don't need the money. That's a really good first world life problem. They need to collect starting at age 70 at the latest. So now let's talk about the cost of collecting early. So in the event that somebody says, you know what, forget it. I'm collecting at 62, a bird in the hand. I want my money today. Um, they're going to collect about 75% of what that full benefit would have been at their full retirement age. So let me explain that a different way. For every year someone waits to collect their Social Security ben benefit between 62 and their full retirement age, they get about a, about a 6% raise per year they wait to collect. Now, people say like 6%, is that that much money? And it's like, well, when was the last time you got a 6% raise from your employer? It's that much money. It's a big deal, right? Like employers don't give raises like that. So yeah, it is a big deal. And then ready for this, for every eight year you wait to collect between your full retirement age and age 70, you get an 8% raise per year every single year you wait to collect. So that's why going back to that slide where I said you almost collect twice as much money at age 70 as compared to age 62, why that is because every year you get a boost. Now people say to me, they're like, Kelly, how come the difference between 62 and 63, it's not even that much, I'm just gonna collect. It's like, well, it's a compounding effect, right? That's how money works. And the compounding effect of money, you gotta keep money in the program longer in order for it to grow and grow and grow because 6% of a bigger number is a bigger number, 8% of even bigger numbers and even bigger number. Now there's spousal benefits. So 
I'm going to give you an example. My mom, most of you know, if you've heard me speak before, my mom was a school administrator, middle school principal. My dad was a dairy farmer. My dad never paid a dollar into Social Security. He claimed a loss on the business every year for tax purposes. Um, and so my dad wasn't entitled to Social Security benefits. He did not contribute to the program you've got to put in to get out, right? But being that he was married to my mom, my mom obviously contributed to Social Security just being a school employee. And because of that, my mom, my dad automatically became eligible for Social Security benefits as a result of my mom being eligible for those benefits. So my mom's maximum Social Security benefit at her, her full retirement age, which was 66, was about $2,400 a month. Even though my dad never contributed a dollar to the system, by default, he's eligible for 50% of that amount or $1,200 a month. And in the event that my uh, mother predeceased my father, he would automatically pop up to her $2,400 a month and would no longer collect the $1,200 a month he's collecting. The surviving spouse gets the higher of the two amounts. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, you know, you think about it and people who are stay-at-home parents or people who are maybe business owners, the benefits associated with being married to somebody that has those good benefits, like most of you do on this call, is a really big deal short-term and long-term. With that, there's also survivor benefits. What I mean by that is if and when someone passes away, the surviving spouse will continue to get Social Security benefits. Brace yourself for this one. Whenever someone passes away, doesn't matter what age, their beneficiary through Social Security gets $255. Where did that number come from? Well, when Social Security was developed, created, inventive, whatever, in 1935, that was the cost of a burial, and it's never adjusted for inflation. So people will say, why did I get this random 255 bucks? Because that's what Social Security pays you upon a passing. However, there's also other survivor benefits in the event that somebody passes um, earlier on in life and, uh, and doesn't live to maybe 80 or 90 years old and they die early on, their spouse will continue to get Social Security benefits as can their surviving children. Then if you're divorced, so ready for this, if you were married for 10 years and then got divorced, in the event that happened, and there's some other uh, parameters in place, which are listed on the screen at this time, that ex-spouse is still entitled to the ex-spouse's social security benefits. Now, I want to be clear, it does not in any way, shape, or form negatively impact either ex-spouse. Like usually people get real bent on a shape. They're like, my ex-spouse has already taken me to the cleaners for enough. It's like, I get it, but this doesn't hurt you in any way. It doesn't matter. It's so it's nothing to you. It's only helping them, um, you know, and, and that's that it is what it is. It's not a debate. It's not an election. So that's a lot different than like through New York State where you would elect these benefits. You do not. They're automatically built in, into Social Security. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say, hypothetically, I got married and divorced four times and I was married for 10 years each. I could pick between my four ex-spouses Social Security benefits and collecting based off of that or my own. I am, that is not a recommendation to get married and divorced 10 times. It's a, that's a poor, that is not a great life plan. So please do not misinterpret my message there. My message is just that there's a lot of flexibility and nuances to the system. So let's talk about some other factors which uh, impact Social Security. So one factor is, let's say somebody says, forget it. I'm collecting at age 62. I want my money today. Give me my money. Social Security says, hold on a second. That's okay. We're willing to do that. But if you make over a certain amount of money a year, we're going to penalize you because you're not fully retiring our eyes. I know the um, limits on this slide are a little bit older, but the new limits in 2022, if you collect your Social Security prior to your full retirement age, 
of six, let's assume 67 in this example, if you make more than $19,250 a year, um, basically that's where that penalty comes in, which is um, 50 cents on the dollar. It's a pretty severe penalty. So you got to make sure that you manage that accordingly. Social Security says if you want to retire at 62 and collect, that's fine. Maybe work a part-time job, but we're going to cap you on your earnings. Otherwise, you're not really fully retired. Once somebody gets to their full retirement age, that limit reduces significantly. So just so you know, as time goes on, that does change. Now let's talk about Social Security benefits or tax. So step number one, Social Security benefits are not taxed New York State taxable. So just so you know, just like a New York State pension is not subject to New York State taxes, Social Security is also not subject to New York State taxes. And Social Security tax is going to be dependent on income levels. Now, almost everyone on this call is going to fit into one category, and that's going to be category number three. So the three categories, either Social Security is not federally taxed at all, half of it is taxed, or 85% of it's taxed. Now, I'm not saying the taxes are 85%. I'm saying of the total benefit, 85% is subject to federal income tax. However, everyone gets 15% of their social security benefit completely tax-free, which is pretty great. Like free money is typically the best money, so we'll take it. Um, but as you can see, if somebody is married filing jointly based on the right-hand side of the slide and they make over 44,000 a year, which many, many pension earners in the state of New York do, automatically about 85% of their social security benefits are going to be subject to federal income tax based on your tax bracket. That's not a debate. That's not a discussion. That's not a how do I manipulate that. It is what it is. Um, it's just a, a, a real scenario. So now let's talk about benefits collecting strategies. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break down a scenario. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at scenarios that come up. You've got a married couple that both collect at 62, a married couple that waits till that full retirement age or 66 to collect, and then a couple that collects at 70. We're assuming in these examples, this couple lives till age 85 and they are today age 62. Okay. So um, we've got Rob and we've got Mary in this hypothetical example. So in the event, uh, so you could see you, what Rob's benefit would be at age 62, his full retirement age 66, and this is a monthly benefit. If he waited till age 70, and then a hybrid example. So what that means is if they chose at different ages to collect, which is very common, then you can see what Mary's benefit would be and Mary's spousal benefit. So when it comes to Mary's benefit or the spousal benefit, Social Security will always give someone the better of the two. You don't get both, you get the better of the two. So if somebody collects at 62 in this example on the left-hand side of the slide, Rob's benefit would be $1,500 a month, and then Mary could get $375 a month or $350 a month. $375 a month, if she chose that, would be better in this example for a total of $2,225 in monthly income from Social Security. If they wait till age 66, that would increase to $3,000 a month at, six, at that age. If they were to wait till age 70, that would be $3,640 a month. And a hybrid example would be about $3,365 a month. So looking deeper into those numbers, let's add that up over time and see what that determines. So if they both collect at 62 here, kind of in the center left of the slide, you can see that total benefits to age 85 in this hypothetical situation would be about $880,000 of total income collected from Social Security. Nothing to sniff at. That's a big deal amount of money. If they both collected at 66, in my example, the full retirement age, they collect just over a million bucks. If they wait till age 70, they'd get $1,046,000. And then the hybrid of collecting at different ages would be $1,056,000. So often if we're looking at a married couple, though it's extremely situational, we're looking at someone maybe collecting a little bit earlier while someone may be waiting a little later to collect. But that's kind of come down to someone's individual retirement plan and their focus on goals.
So if we're strictly talking about with all of this, I want the most money. How do I do that? It's not always collecting at 62. Now, that being said, you've heard me say this before, if you know when you're going to pass away, it's a lot easier for us to run these numbers to determine what the answer is. But um, if we're strictly talking about what's the best leverage of the dollar, it can be sometimes waiting to collect. However, there's a lot of factors that play into that. And I really want to encourage all of you on this call to be mindful of it's not a one size fits all approach um, and that everybody's situation is different. And that's where planning comes in with your financial advisor, whether it's through Equitable, myself or someone else, to make sure that you're weighing out the pros and the cons of all the options because there are benefits and takeaways that are negative both sides of this conversation. So with that, I'm going to pivot and address some questions that we have. So with that, uh, somebody had asked, can you br briefly address if and how the COLA increases this year will impact the calculation of the benefit? Uh, that's a great question. So unlike your New York State pension, New York State pension gets little to no cost of living adjustment. It's very unremarkable. Social Security does get a cost of living adjustment, and it's extremely significant this year. In that, Fred, the way that it works when you elect to collect in three years is like I said in the very first part of the presentation, they look at your earnings history and they do true you up to that year's inflation level. Let me explain why that is. We're in an extreme period of inflation now, but maybe we're in a period in a couple of years of deflation. So what they're going to do in th whenever someone collects in that year, they're going to true up all earnings to what inflation is in that year so that things are all things equal. OK, so it is extremely fair how people are treated. And that would not be a scenario where someone says, boy, with this inflation and cost of living adjustment, I should collect earlier than later. No, it is universally fair to the to you, the participant when you would collect. Do RMDs count towards the amount of income? Absolutely, Fred. What are you talking about? Of course they do. Yes, the answer to that is emphatically yes. We're talking about the IRS here. Yes, they want their money in any way they can get it. So that is a very clear answer that I have, but that's a very good question. Uh, going to the example of uh, questions about Robin Mary. Is Mary able to take both her own benefit and the spousal benefit? It is an either or. There was a time with Social Security where you could uh, play the game of collecting a little bit of both. That time has long passed. So it is the best of the two, either hers or the spousal benefit. Um, the Financial Fridays videos can be found right on the Husseini's website. They're usually posted a few days after the Financial Friday. I appreciate your blatant plug about them being helpful. And then the last question, I believe, if your spouse wants to collect 50% of your benefit, do they need to wait till you collect? Typically, the answer is yes to that. However, I would encourage you to call Social Security with questions like that because they can get very, very specific to each situation. So with that, um, if anybody has any questions, as you all know, I'm available. Please feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, I am here in Rochester, but I serve Saneys in all of New York State. So any way that I can help and assist with unique situations or just general questions, there is no wrong or bad question. Please feel free to reach out. Um, and then we're also going to be sending an email as a follow-up just so that you have contact information, need anything assist, uh, with assistance. Um, somebody had asked, can we see our social security on the web? If you go to the website, ssa.gov and create a login, it's a really well-designed website. It's very user-friendly. You'll be able to very quickly determine what your benefits are for the future. And with that, I think that we're all set. So thanks everybody for tuning in today. I really appreciate your time.